How ka? Meme yuta menue. Rick Chavoya, kumiai, ipai. I I know you all know that within a city is still our land. So in New York City, it's Lenape land, right? So the original name of Len, of the, of the island that I live on, I'm in Greenwich Village, was Manhattan. Sounds very similar, right, to Manhattan. <laughs> so that's the, that's where, that's the, Manhattan is a derivative of the Lenape name for Manhattan, which is then um, Manhattan. And then, of course, the Dutch arrived and somehow interpreted a gift-giving process that we as indigenous people always partake in when new arrivals come as transactional. And so they, they suddenly believed they owned the island, right? And that's, that's a, a misunderstanding that frequently happens because, and I always say this, and I, it simplifies it to some extent, but it really gets to the essence of the truth. We are relational, and many of the settlers who arrived here from European countries were transactional. So they believed if, if something was exchanged, it wasn't to build relations, it was to, to pursue commerce. It was to buy. Whereas we had no real, we had no conception of that. We exchanged, we gifted, and we gifted each other. And if you want to say our economy, I don't like to even say that. It's our life ways are such that we were always gifting one another. And I'm not trying to say it was ideal. There were there were certainly all kinds of you know difficulties and challenges we had here before Europeans ever arrived. So I'm not going to try to romanticize the past. But that was a pretty essential way and understanding of how we met one another was through through the practice of gifting, not through transactional uh, sorts of agreements. But that was the, probably the first major misunderstanding between us, and it resulted in us, in Lenape in this case, losing an island. So at Standing Rock, um, we sent a large, that, 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 I don't know who that is, but somebody's been anyway. Yeah. Um, so when we were at, at we, we took a, a large contingent of, of native indigenous folks from New York City out to Standing Rock during the time of the water protection in solidarity. And we also worked with large companies in New York City to provide supplies. So one of our biggest do donations came from Patagonia. And we worked at the Patagonia star stores. They have several stores in Manhattan. They, were tr they wanted to be supportive. It was certainly a time when they were really ramping up their, their, their connection and their support of, of environmental issues, as they always have, but specifically around um, what's, what was happening uh, Indian country. So um, they gave us a, literally a van full of top of the line winter gear that we were able to take out to, to Standing Rock. And when we got there, the end of November, just before it gets really cold, right, it was, it was very welcomed. It was, it was, it was something that was, it was, people took out, people were, you know, we were finding ways to distribute, you know, what we could. And then so we spent uh, a couple weeks there and after that experience, we thought to ourselves, how can we bring our support for water protectors back to New York City? And it's pretty obvious. What, what can we do? Where does the money come from to finance these pipelines? Yeah. Banks in New York City. Banks in New York. Wall Street. Exactly. Wall Street. <laughs> and the buck stops with us in New York City. So we decided as indigenous people, we could come back to New York City and we could get involved in a divestment movement. And one of the best places to start, because we felt it was very visible and it was, a, it was a lot of money, was getting the city of New York to start divesting from these banks. So when we came back from Standing Rock, we gave a series of talks and we tried to organize people, and this is one of our many talks at the community house, we tried to organize people around the divestment of, of, of monies from, um, from these pipeline funders. At the time, the largest investor was Wells Fargo. And there were actually a lot of reasons to not be crazy about Wells Fargo, right? But that was certainly one of them. And so we organized a, a huge number of people to do two things, to help us put pressure on the this, this city. Because as you know, I'm sure a lot of you have done organizing, right? And maybe do, doing organizing right now. One of the crucial things about organizing is you have to target certain things that you find could be winnable. You know, if you just go out and say, Let's get every bank on earth to divest all their money from all the pipelines everywhere. It's not, it's not something you're ever going to achieve. But if you can focus in, like what we, what we decided to do is let's focus in on the city 
and get them to take their hundreds of millions of dollars out of one big, the greatest funder of the pipeline in Standing Rock, which was Wells Fargo. So that's where we started. That's where we started focusing our efforts, and we had, a, you know, hall after hall after hall of this, and we asked people to do two things: help us do that by coming to all of our actions, to writing letters, you know, to putting pressure in whatever the way they could to this on the city, on De Blasio. There, there happened. There ended up being people who actually knew people within the De Blasio administration, which happens when you bring people together. There's people who have varying levels of connections around these things. We asked people to take their own personal money out of Wells Fargo's and some of the other big financiers of Standing Rock, which we would have days in which we would explain to people, and that this might have been one of them. If it wasn't, there were other ones we'd bring lots of people together, and people who were, were did have their investments in some of these banks, we would explain how to divest from them personally. Because sometimes it's not that simple, as you know. Like, if you have varying types of, of monies or, you know, commitments financially into some of these institutions, it's not as easy as, as, as sometimes we think it's going to be to say, to walk up to the, to the teller, take all my money out of here, you know? You've got to go through some, as well as trying to figure out, well, where do, if I take it out of here, where, do, where can I put it in? So one of the things we did is we had made, we had marches throughout the city. Um, these are a bunch of the folks, just one of the many ones we had. So this is one of the many marches and one of the many actions we had around the city of New York. All of our actions, whenever we went out and did these kind of things, you know, so you're raising awareness. Of course, we've got press. You know, there was articles in the Daily News and the New York Times and so forth. And so we like to believe you never can you never can absolutely quantify this, but we like to believe that we were part of the pressure that Mayor De Blasio then decided to divest city money from from Wells Fargo. So we were able to look at that and say, hey, that's a little bit of a victory, right? So this is literally on the steps of City Hall, uh, and we knew we knew when Mayor De Blasio was coming back from the meeting because we have inside sources, and he had to come by this, and he spent time with us, and he actually spoke with us for a while, and a few of his commissioners also did. Um, so, and we rely on that as well because when you're in the city and you start getting out in the public and you start asking people for support, you never know in what way they're going to offer their support. You know, and so we had some people wherever we are. We also have some people on the inside. We say, actually, you know what? I have some inside information that might be helpful. You know, some things that can, can help you in terms of your, in terms of your, uh, you know, your, your impact. This is the United Nations, and the other way that we realize that in New York City we can we can really be um, a support to Indigenous people throughout Indian Country um, is by working on the international side. So we do a lot of work at the United Nations. We do a lot of talks. We organize a lot of a lot of things in the nation to. At the, at the United Nations to bring our issues to the forefront. And one of the times we can really do it is during the UN uh, Permanent Forum, uh, which happens annually, and it's always in late spring, either late April or early May, uh, and indigenous people come from all over the world, and we discuss um, the issues that are, that are most important to us. And so when that happens, we make sure we take care of as many indigenous people who come out to New York as possible. So we find housing for them, we find um, support in all sorts of ways. We have dinners and luncheons over at the community house. Uh, we um, help them move around the city. We give them subway tickets. Uh, we, you know, just in whatever way we can, we give them, we make sure that they get the um, clearance when they, if they want to come to the United Nations because some don't have sponsorship all the time. And we do as a registered group of the United Nations, the community house, and other, and other groups that I work with, including the NGO on, on, uh, on indigenous, uh, indigenous rights. We also have status with the UN, and so through one of those groups or others, we make sure that everybody who's had difficulty registering to come into the UN and voice their concerns from their, from their indigenous nations don't have those problems. So now one of our big solidarity movements is with uh, Bears Ears. And you know, that's close to you, so that kind of brings it back to, to you all and to your home. And who's had a chance to go out to Bears Ears and spend some time? Yeah. If you haven't, you'll, you'll realize, even if you don't know exactly where the medicine is, if you have a chance to spend time there, you're going to know that it's a place of, of very, very important medicine. You can just, you can just feel it. It's a, it's a very powerful place. And you know, not, not to get too political, but you know, this particular guy who's in the White House now, as you know, reduced the size of, of a historic agreement that was made between five 
tribal nations and President Obama to make this a protected area through the National, national Monument System, right, the, the National Park Service. And I say this all the time, but I like to remind people that it is, in fact, very historic in a number of ways. First of all, those five, native, those five tribal nations had never really quite done work like that together. You know, so for them to come together and determine a goal like this around uh, a national monument being preserved uh, is, is, very, very, is very, very unique and very historic. The other is that at no time has the U.S. government and, 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 and tribal nations come to an equal partnership to protect a land through the Park Service. It's always in the end, even if, even if we've had consultation in, 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 in the process and, and continue once it's a park or monument or recreation site or whatever, this is the first time where the agreement was that there, there would be an equal partnership between the five tribal nations and the U.S. government to protect this particular monument. So the fact that now it's being threatened in the way it is, and I'm sure you all know the history of that area. There were extractive industries of all sorts all through the, all through the Bears Ears area. And we know, because we always have people out in the field in these areas, we know there's people who are already eyeballing it. There's engineers from companies, uranium companies and so forth, who've already been spotting out you know, where, where they would go first if it was ever opened up to them. So um, it's, it's a time where we, again, we need to have you know, sort of a, not sort of, a, 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 real, a real coalition, a real unified um, effort between indigenous people and all people to protect this, this, sacred, this sacred area, that space. You know, um, and I don't know if anybody knows Ruben Gallego. He's uh, um, in the House of Representatives out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are in Arizona probably know him. And he's been a pretty good ally to us, and he even introduced, as many of you know, a bill to protect Bears Ears, in, in, you know, sort of in a, to combat you know, the presidential move to, to reduce it, right? But here's the interesting thing. He had not been to Bears Ears. He introduced that bill before he'd been to Bears Ears. So we knew he was an ally, so he's not the person you're talking about. He's not someone who has to move from, from square one all the way over. But at the same time, we still believe that for him to really be committed, he needed to come out. So we, had, so we did bring him out. And I was part of the trip. There's some photos I'm going to show more. You know, here we are, you know. But just take my word where we were able to host him and spend the day taking him around the Bears Ears area, a whole group of us. Um, along with some other officials that you, that you speak of, many of them more sympathetic to the cause, but, it's, but a couple of them not so much. So, some of them didn't, who didn't. Because there's different ways of being committed. You can say, yeah, I kind of believe in that, but you're not necessarily going to take action on it. You know, but we want to we want to move people who don't care at all to care, people who care but haven't taken action to take action, and those who are starting to take action to be even more committed and to be the person who's going to go to the very end with it. And I think Ruben's one of those people who we moved further in terms of his commitment. Because when he spent time out there, he was just like, wow, when he heard the stories, when, he, when we were able to really spend time and talk to him, and you could tell it, it, it moved him. And people who've been in Washington for a while, mm -hmm. even, if they're, even if they're sort of with you, to see them moved is sort of different. You can, and it's understandable. You, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time in DC ourselves, and I can see how people can get very, very cynical if you spend time there. So I think that's one of the biggest, the biggest ways of doing it. You know, the other is just do your homework, you know, find out who you're talking to, know where they're coming from, think about what might be compelling to them, find out about what they care about, try to intersect what is important for us to be telling them as a message, um, have, try to find ways that it intersects with what they care about. You know, and so the more, the more you think about that, you can usually find ways in which that person is going to sort of listen in a way that they may not have before. Something you're seeing is going to resonate with them because they, it's, they're, you're, you're connecting, to, connecting, it, connecting it to something they already care about. So, but it's a good question because that's, that's what I hope we all do, right? We're all out there as advocates. Because I know you all care as much as we do about, about protecting this incredible land wherever it may be. So yeah, the question you asked come, becomes a very essential one. How do, we, how do we convince people? How do we move other people who are not as committed as we are around protecting this land, around protecting, you know, our Mother Earth, and, uh, and, and getting them to that place where they are. So, thank you. Any other? Yeah. I have a question. Just um, 
I'd love to hear more about your childhood or about how you got interested, how you ended up running the community house. And, <laughs> you know, and, uh, yeah, where you, where oh my your gosh. connections <laughs> well, kiddo, when you connected with the land as a kiddo. <laughs> I turned 60 in three weeks, so it's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was three, now I'm not going to make you feel I'll make it brief. It's through my mother, because my mother's Kumiai. And she's from the San Pasquale Reservation in, in, outside San Diego. Um, and she's the one who, who always took us to the land. She's the one who told us the stories. She's the, she's the one who, who made sure we understood our connection to the land and our, and our values. And you showed the acorns. We're, we're acorn people, as, as you probably know. A lot, a lot of people in California are acorn people, right? And by that I mean it was an essential part of our life. And we, there's a process we go by to which we blanch and get the, the, the nut ready um, to, to, to turn to, to, a, to a flower and then, and then a, a, you know, a, 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 an edible, which we've been doing for thousands of years. And as we do that, you know, as our, as our, as our, as our, as our relatives, our family does that, that's when you tell stories, you know. And you're in the process of doing something with the land. You know, it's not just, hey, let's chop up this and throw it in the oven or whatever, you know. You're going through this very long process where you're praying over it, you're giving blessings to what it's providing to you from the land, in this, in this case, acorns, and you're, you're, you're making it something that is going to nourish you in more ways than one. In fact, the, the entire process is nourishing. So that's when, that's when you really come to understand how nourishing the land is. And everybody has stories like that. All, all tribal nations have, have ways in which they, they not only are in the place, but they have that kind of relation where they, they go through this, this, this process with the land of building that relation and understanding how, how, you know, how it nourishes them, you know? Um, and, and the other is that for us, a big part of our connection to the land um, is through our origin stories. You know, so we talk about where, where, we, where we came as a people, you know? And it's always from, the, from, the, from the, just the heart of the land, you know? It's, it's just, an, it's just, it's, it's so much in, it's so much, it's, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just, it's just in the spirit of, of the land that you know where, where, all your, where all your people came from and, and the stories are very, very long so you, you understand them through, through all sorts of ways in which, you know, the, the people came of that land, we came of that land, you know, so you know, you know, you're not, you're not looking to, and I don't know, and this is meant to be no, I don't mean to be, this to be offensive to anybody who, who's of these other faiths, but faiths. But it's not kind of like, well, one of these days I got to get to Bethlehem and find out where our spirituality began, you know. Or we got to get to Mecca and get to where our spiritual spirituality began. Our spirituality begins, you know, in our in our home right here, you know, wherever it may be, you know, within these lands we are in, all the time. And so, when when you have when you have that kind of connection, then then you, then you know that that's that's. That's got to be the way you, you live your life, you know. Um, and, and as I said before, when you're taught day in and day out about who your relatives are, as my mother did with me, um, and literally, not, not figuratively, not metaphorically, no, these are your relatives, these are your relations, the same way your sister, your brother, your mother, your aunties, the same way they are your relations, these are your relations, and you care for them in the same way, you speak to them in the same way, you listen to them in the same way, you learn from them in the, them in the same way. You know, and if you grow up, with that, then it's not, it doesn't, it does, it's not an abstract concept to say, oh, I've got to protect the land, I've got to be connected to the land, I've got to, you know, um, it's just, it's just, it's just how you live your, your life every day to be, to be in, you know, to be in some way in, you know, in, in, in honor and in, in communication and in relation with the land. So I hope that helps, but that's, yeah. that's, that's how I grew up, you know, I grew up, and even when I left the land, you know, and I, and I became, an, as they say, an herb. One of my one of my native native friends does does research, and that's where he says, yeah, that's 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 what you all are, is herbs. You know, um, U R B. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, even when you get to the, even when you get off off your land and you're in an urban area, you still maintain that connection. And we we and we te and we're taught by our elders all the time about even in urban areas, it's still the land. You know, there's still land there. And the buildings are of cement, which is from the land, and of steel, which is from the land, you know. And there's, and there's, um, aquifers underneath, you know, running as they always have. And there's, you know, there's rivers, and there's, there, you know, in the case of New York, rivers, the Hudson, and the East, and 
the East River and the, and the, and the ocean, and you know, so uh, all, it's all still there. Mm -hmm. It's all still there, and so you have to maintain that connection to that. And when I go, I do my prayers at, at, at the river, and you know, that's and that's and water's the most sacred, and and, the, and it's no matter where you are, you just remember that. You remember whose land you're on. You acknowledge the land you're on, as the as in our case, Lenape, or if you go. Out into Long Island, the Shinnecock, or if you go upstate, the Haudenosaunee, you know, you, and, and you're always aware as a native person of whose land you're on. Actually, whether you're in an urban area or not, you know, you, you'll you'll move off what we call a red road, you know, and the red road is a way you try to maintain your your connection to your to your ancestors and to your elders and to your your nativeness in, in every way. Um, and sometimes, you know, you definitely veer off. I know I veered off the red road, and um, and the thing is, is that it doesn't matter how far you go or how much you veer. Your elders and your ancestors are always there. They're always they're always there for you. You can always go back, and the teachings are always there. The teachings are always there, and you know the teachings, and you you have those in you, you know, and. A lot of times you have to just reach back into that and, and, and bring them to your to your own your own way of life again. Um, but you do do that. And the other way is just a very practical way, which we do at the community house. We bring each other together. We're very communal people, right? And so um, one of the ways we lose the red road is when we become separated and we feel like we're alone, we're on our own. And that's when we start to lose sight of what we need to be doing in terms of ceremony, in terms of prayer, in terms of, you know, listening to our, our elders, our ancestors, and all, all our relations. We typically are more likely, to, much like more likely to do that when we're starting to feel alone um, or, or, or very removed from our community, you know, which is exactly what they do with the boarding schools. You know, when my mother, and I do use the word abducted, I don't, I don't mince words, when my mom was abducted from her, from her land, from her reservation, she, she lost touch with so much. She, you, they lose, our people lost touch with their families, with their communities, with their, and that was the idea. They wanted to isolate us. But you know what? Lo and behold, we were put into boarding schools and we actually found each other again. And you'll hear stories of a lot of people who went to boarding schools and they formed really, really close relationships and got through that trauma with each other and continued to work with each other long after the boarding school time. And a lot of our leaders who did all sorts of amazing things, like started our tribal colleges, or, or you know, have done all sorts of incredible things for our sovereignty and the protecting of our, of our sovereignty and our treaty rights and so forth. They work with one another, and where they first met was in those boarding courts, and we find ways to, to strengthen ourselves once again and get back to the way we live and get back to our ceremony and get back to, um, you know, leading our lives the, the way we know our elders and ancestors have prayed that we will and how the seven generations to come need us to, right? Because that's the other part, is when we understand responsibility, because a, a, a fundamental part of being indigenous, and I think being human in general, is a sense of responsibility. You know, so we, that's something also, when we're in community, when, you know, when, we're, when we're together as community, we remind ourselves of those things, and, and we, stay, we stay strong that way. So. Those are some of the ways. And then, mm -hmm. like I said already, just reminding ourselves, no matter how urban it is, we're still, we're still on land. We're still on our land, you know? I don't know who's here. What, what is the community house like? I mean, is it a, how big of a, is it a building or a It is. It's not, it's not, it's, it's a floor in a building. It's okay. not a lot of room. We've had to move, we've had to move several times. We've had larger community houses. Uh -huh. but the one we're in right now is the smallest we've been in. And I'm sure we can predict why. We have to pay rent like everybody else in New York, so we're always we're always searching for the most affordable, you know, place to, for us to be. So we've had to move out of some places over the years because they just got too expensive. And to tell you the truth, we're in a really crucial. We're in. A, we're in I won't say a crisis, but we're in. We're in, a, we're in a real crucial juncture because all of New York has got too expensive. It's almost impossible. Even even neighborhoods they thought would never get expensive, like Bushwick and Bed Stuy in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. right? Are the rents gone up, 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 up? So what we're really doing now, and, and I appreciate this this question because I wouldn't have thought of talking about this. Now we're trying to build relations with with entities 
that can gift us property. And we think of it this way. In fact, one of my sisters at the community house, Melissa Oak, she's Mohawk, likes to say, hey, rent's due. You know, you've been on our land for all these years. You need to pay up. You need to pay up to the property. <laughs> and come through with a really, really, really top of the line, nice piece of property that we can move into where we can have ceremony room, where we can have an outdoor area for sweat, where we can have an, a theater area, an art gallery, um, areas where we can have confidential um, clinical work with some of our folks who have really difficult you know, issues to, to deal with. We can do referrals of all type for housing, for, for, you know, for services, legal services, et cetera. You know? So rent's due. And that's, that's, and, that's the, and that's the message we're giving to the city of New York. That's, the, that's what we're, what we're giving to um, a lot of big property owners, you know, real estate developers, you know, whoever, whoever's going to listen. You know, that's, that's what we're telling them. It's, it's, it's time. It's time that the people you displaced um, have, a, have a home again that we don't have to, you know, struggle to pay for. Um, I think it's, personally, we think it's the least they can do, right? Mm -hmm. And those, those, those conversations are actually going fairly well. We're, we're, in, we're in good communication with the city in particular. Um, and the interesting thing is, those of you who know enough about New York and can remember the, the history of New York, um, we had a mayor, Mayor Dinkins, um, first African American mayor of, of, um, of New York, and he, he thought more about who are the marginalized groups in New York City, right? And he was the first to really think seriously about the native population in New York City, and he actually had a liaison to the, to the, um, the native community during those, those years that helped us in all sorts of ways. They helped connect us with things, they helped find resources for us, we had, we had a good space and time, you know, and if, if we were having difficulty in other ways, they would do what they could to support us. And guess who, during his terms, guess who one of the liaisons was under Dinkins? The current Mayor de Blasio. De Blasio. Oh. Yeah, because as you probably know, de Blasio worked for, for Mayor, de Mayor Dinkins. So, um, so we're using that as leverage, and we'll admit we are using that for leverage, and we've gotten, we're, in con we're in continuous communication with his commissioners, and so you never know, you know, oh, another entity we talk, we talk to are our church, particularly the Catholic Church, um, because Anybody owes us something. Um, yeah. <laughs> I tell them for myself, as a Kumi, even before the military, even before the conquistadors, because they, our our capital for the Kumi was right where the Spanish mission is now in, in, in San Diego. San Diego Mission, if anybody's been to San Diego, that big beautiful mission, they made sure they planted that. Talk about Plymouth Rock falling on us. They made sure they planted that mission right on top of our capital. And it was a statement on the, on the, on the, on the Catholic Church saying, this is ours now, and we're going to make sure you you are converted. And if you don't convert voluntarily, we'll find other ways of converting you, and we'll, and we'll displace you from your land. And that's when you know we started moving off the coastal areas, and now all of our reservations are in the mountains east of San Diego. But we were coastal people originally, and we would go to those mountains. Of course, those mountains were good hunting areas. They were where a lot of our medicine was. But our but our main our main areas of living of life were were, were much closer to the coast. So we've also gone to the Catholic Church and we've made the case that, hey, you have property. At one time, I don't think it's true anymore, but at one time they were the largest property owners in New York City. Yeah. You know? But now, of course, they're selling everything off because they got all these you know, lawsuits to deal with. Um, so do you have a liaison with the Pope at the Vatican? <laughs> no. Not yet. No, no, no. <laughs> but no. In fact, they sort, of, they sort of avoid us, to tell you the truth, because we, we bring a lot to them that makes them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The first being, People probably know the Doctrine of the Discovery. That was a papal bull. So it was the, they came right after Columbus landed and was now Puerto Rico. And it was a papal bull that declared that anybody who was not from Europe was lesser than, was, was less than human, and therefore could be taken over, enslaved, displaced from their land. And that was a Catholic papal bull that declared that. Mm -hmm. So from and, and that has not be res been rescinded or condemned by the church to this day. So we have an ongoing campaign to have them declare that, you know, completely unacceptable, condemn it, rescind it, and, <clears throat> and they won't do that. We were talking earlier about when um, and Sarah, Sarah, if you want to pronounce it with a double L, our church, Shrill, who, Nepado, who people know, was the, 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 the most prominent missionary in California, when he was going through the process of being canonized, 
we also, not just California Native people, although we were certainly at the forefront, but, but a lot of indigenous folks all over the country, certainly and even beyond, were supporting us and stopping that, you know, stopping him from being canonized, from becoming, becoming a saint. But we didn't, we didn't win that one. But that was another point of, of you know, very serious difference with the church. So um, they're not, they're, they're, they're as much wary of indigenous people now as they have been for a long time, you know? So does the UN or someone else help you applying pressure? Yeah, yes and no. That's that's a really good question. The UN we're also applying pressure on the UN because we want to have a we want to have a permanent seat at the UN. Mm -hmm. Not unlike the, the Vatican has. Mm -hmm. You know, the Vatican has permanent representation at, at the UN. But we as indigenous people don't, you know. And as you know, Palestine just got a, a limited representation. You know, they're still moving, you know, forward with the, with, with their but when we, we talk with Palestinian people, you know, talking about the strategies they use to get to get where they are at, at this point with the UN. But then there's some people who don't feel that's necessarily uh, the best use of our time. There's, there's a lot of debate even within the indigenous community as to where we should really put our efforts. So, um, if I could ask one more question. I, so can I just, sure, she's had a hand up for a while. Thanks. Um, I, I'd like to ask you about land again. So, um, one of the issues that I think people throughout the country you're facing is that. Do you mind if I sit? Mm -hmm. That's great. No. It feels funny standing up in front of all you. Know. <laughs> it's a big, issue a big circle, yeah. That um, you know, not not just on native lands, on indigenous lands, but also off of them on other you know federal lands and so on. Absolutely. Resources are are like the people who make decisions about natural resources, about the land, about wildlife, and so on, are overwhelmingly not indigenous people, and that's even true on the Navajo Nation, on Menominee, like the staffs of the agencies, the tribal agencies that are charged with making decisions about the forests, about wildlife and so on and about their use are not um, of those cultures. So, um, I mean, this is something that I think a lot of people have a lot of interest in addressing in, in building that capacity to reclaim control of decision-making power management of resources, not only on native lands, but also everywhere else on the continent, and to bring it back to New York, I grew up there, so. It's, you did? It's near where, and dear to my heart. Where'd you, where'd you grow up? In Manhattan. You so, did, okay, yeah. great. Which neighborhood? Uh, we moved around, so. Oh, okay. But you know New York's very neighborhood-based, so you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Everybody wants, when you say, you, you say you're from Queens New York. Queensborough Bridge, like in, right yeah, there. Yeah, you live in New York <laughs> to, another, to another New Yorker, they, right away they want to know what neighborhood. You know? Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. We moved a little bit, but kind of midtown east side. Okay. So. Um, I wanted to, I mean, I have, I have like three questions and I'll just give them all to you. You can kind of answer whichever pieces you want. Um, the best I can. One is, I encounter some tension around students wanting to, people are studying to want to fill those roles, feeling tension between the traditional teachings about how you relate to the land and the sort of Western science that they need to learn in order to be able to step into those roles. So I'm curious about your thoughts on that. I'm curious what that might look like in a place like New York. This is, you know, this incredible system of parks and public lands throughout the city that, to my understanding, you know, don't have staff from Lenape or other, you know, local indigenous perspectives in them, and wh what you think that might look like if you, if you were to be able to insert that perspective more, how might use of those lands look different or management of those lands look different or interpretation look different there? And I guess my third question is probably the easy one, which is just, you know, you, you talked about connections to finance and politics in New York. Um, there are also a lot of colleges and universities. And do you see um, ways to involve young indigenous students in the city in is a full range of things? But the one I'm especially interested in is reclaiming that that um, voice in the management of the land. Yeah. Wow. Great questions, and yeah. all of which could be we could write a book together. Right? Um, <laughs> but um, I'll answer the first one because um, that has a fairly direct answer, and it's yes, the, the, na the Native Indigenous students in the New York area who are in the colleges are very involved with, with we're all involved together um, in a lot of things. In fact, I could show you another picture, um, but a number of the people who went with us to Standing Rock were in fact co Native college students um, who, were, who were very committed to, to supporting the water protectors. Um, and they, I think we work together, and, and, the, and what, what 
I guess what they do in particular is bring home the fact that these institutions have great influence, the Columbia's and, and the NYU's of the world have great influence and the people who come out of them. So if they, if they have a better understanding while they're in college, that's good. But it's also good if they become more aware and take that out into the larger world and what, you know, whatever they're doing, wherever they go. Uh, and so both universities are working hard and we, we support and work with those students to do all sorts of things to, as I say, indigenize the, the institution. So for example, um, we've worked for a great deal of time with NYU and they just, um, they just approved a Native American studies, and Native Indigenous studies minor last spring. So it's small steps. It isn't like, oh, earth shattering, but it does have now a formalized curriculum that people can, can have a minor in and it organizes all the, the courses in a way that people understand how they can learn more about indigenous people can be promoted that way, right? And it's a, 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 a way in which more indigenous people can be brought into the university as faculty, as administrators, mm -hmm. and that's already happened. They've already made two new um, ha faculty hires that are uh, indigenous scholars, right? Of course, the next step in this part of the conversation, as an example, is that we don't want just Native scholars educated in the Western system, we want to be able to have Native elders who have traditional knowledge to be able to come into university systems as well, as an example. So, and we're having those conversations, and there's other universities who are having those conversations and are already doing it, right? Um, New York, not yet, but that's where we want to go with it. You know, and I've worked with other universities around the country, because I was I worked in universities many years myself, including, including NYU, and one of the things we want to do is not just fit our indigenous people into an existing system, we want to say, no, there's another system of knowledge, another system of learning, which you have to make sure is part of your system of, of learning as well, like, like having traditional knowledge, knowledge keepers um, who haven't the PhDs and the MAs and all that, who have, who have tremendous amount of knowledge to share with people, with all people, to find ways for them to be brought into the academy, what's called the academy, right? So that's one, um, and I'm just giving two examples because you, you asked a lot. The other is an example in Col at Columbia where they worked and, and advocated and pushed the university to, find, to recognize that they are on Lenape land with something very visible. The same way at Placerville, yes? Did yes. I pronounce it right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Placerville has that plaque commemorating the you people, right? Those are the kind of things, again, in the whole scheme of things, they could just be said in a cynical way. You could say, well, it's, it's a small thing, but that's, you build on that, right? And, the, and, they, and they accomplish that as well. So now there's a plaque that sits in the middle of Columbia that says, we are on Lenape land. We give honor to those to the Lenape people, the Lenape nation. And so everybody has to pass it. You look at it. It just starts to, in little ways, find ways to, to, um, to, to, you know, to bring consciousness. Um, as well as we were talking, I, I think I've already mentioned about acknowledgments, which I did at the beginning. And that's a lot of, we work with students to have their institutions, students and faculty and other people in universities, bring their institution to, to acknowledgments, to do land acknowledgments. Um, and lot, land acknowledgments to us are one of the first, first steps towards recognizing indigenous life. Um, anywhere you are, any institution, not just universities, museums, social halls, government, um, you know, government offices, whatever, um, is to for for the people to speak to where they're at, um, acknowledge they're on land that is not really theirs. It's the, it's the land of the people who've been there for thousands of years, um, and it it can be just a token gesture, unless they're working in 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 consort with indigenous people as to how to move. And, and, and have greater progress, and not just make it this one sort of perfunctory um, statement at the, at the beginning of events, because that's, that's too easy. And that's what we talk to, to people about, is that yes, we'd like you to do land acknowledgements, it's the first step, but we're gonna work together so we can move into, into, other, into other areas. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, and in terms of, I think it, it kind of gets into your other question, the, one, the question before that, as to how things would be different. I think those are the ways in which, if, if we had more representation in the way, um, in this decision-making of the city, as to how parks are used, how, how the land is used in general, 
I think we would start to bring all those kinds of, of issues and acknowledgements and knowledge into you know, every, every place so that whoever came to those parks would start to recognize that they're on indigenous land and there would be all sorts of ways that indigenous um, values and indigenous knowledge would be shared. There'd be film series. We'd take down a bunch of those old white colonial guys and start putting up some indigenous you know, uh, monuments of some sort. And I don't think for us it would necessarily be, in fact, we're in discussion with the city right now because um, there's been, a, as you know, over the last couple of years, starting with the Confederate mon mon you know, uh, monuments in the South, there's been big discussion about how a city represents itself in terms of history, right? And New York got in that discussion as well. And we were part of that big debate around, around what should happen with the Columbus statue. Uh, and so, of course, we were advocating it be taken down. Even in, even, uh, we, even, we even knew it was probably unrealistic, you know, that a 300 foot statue would just be sort of torn down. Um, but at the same time, it has to be our, it has to be how, what we advocate for, right? So that's, that's, what, we, that's what we were asking for. Um, but in the end, it came to a compromise where they couldn't take down the Columbus statue, but they could work with us about other ways in which they could recognize indigenous life. Think about if we had a lot of people in decision-making positions around the city. That would just start, that would happen. That would have been happening already. You know, there would have been all kinds of ways in which people would have walked through Manhattan and always been conscious of the fact that, it, that they were on indigenous land in all sorts of ways. We'd be doing the things you're talking about, bringing back more and more indigenous plant life. We're just doing that in small ways. We're, we're working with just individual parks and individual spaces. And there's actually some really cool trails now in New York City that'll take people through indigenous plant life, right? But they're very tiny. But imagine if we had more influential people as part of the entire city decision-making structure. That would be going on all over the place. Anywhere people would go, they'd be thinking about it. And it wouldn't just be like, hey, we're indigenous people. Look at us. Look at us. I think everybody would just enjoy the fact that, you know what? This is what was here for thousands of years. How cool is that? And they're beautiful. And a lot of the stuff we're talking about, I think regardless of, of whether it, it, it brings attention to us, just on, in, its, on its, in its own right, it's, it's something that people would enjoy knowing about and would enjoy seeing and, 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 and being within. So that's, that's, I think, some of the things that would change if we had more, um, if we had more influence and more people, um, which is part of the indigenization that we always talk with any institution about is land acknowledgments, bringing more indigenous people into your staff, more indigenous, you know, curatorial and curriculum and, and, and you know, knowledge uh, in, in whatever ways you, 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 you bring knowledge to people. We have an ongoing, what should I call it? I was about to say one B word, battle. I'll say, I'll say, I'll use a different B word. Um, no, no, I'll just say, an ongoing debate with the, the Natural History Museum. Because if anybody, I'm sure people who've been to New York have been to the Natural History Museum, mm -hmm. and if you walk through some of the encasements, especially if you get into the <coughs> quote, unquote, quote unquote Indian Hall, you find some really problematic things about how we're represented. It's, it's still from a very colonial standpoint. So on this very day, on Indigenous Peoples Day, we, we worked, a number of organizations worked together to have uh, an alternative day at the Natural History Museum where we bring in our own docents. It's, 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 it's an action. It's not, we don't ask them to do this. We just come in sort of secretly, uh, you know, hundreds of people come in and we have a bunch of people who, who are, give different interpretations of what people are seeing throughout the museum mm -hmm. until they eventually try to sort of ask us to leave. But we're not doing anything illegal. Um, it just, they find it a little bit disruptive. So, um, <laughs> but that's, that's an ongoing, that's an ongoing, you know, action we do with the Natural History Museum. But there again, imagine if there were indigenous people in prominent, in prominent positions with the Natural History Museum, that museum would change. You know, and instead of building this huge addition they're going to build, they would spend that money to completely redo the existing museum in a way that really honored indigenous people in their indigenous halls, you know, so, um, yeah, and the first question, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. You've been answering my question for so long. I mean, I, it, you've really already addressed it in the context of the New York example, okay. so we're good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, you got me going, because the, <laughs> the things you ask are work through, it's, it really is a, the, a lot of the work that we do day in and day out. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, and if you, I forgot to ask, if you don't mind if you can introduce yourself, because that's, that's part of our protocol. Um, my name is David, born of Mamie and David from the Oyster Clan. 
Nice. Um, maybe we should start by renaming Custer National Monument yeah. to something else. Right. <laughs> but my question really is, you started this discussion with introducing your thought of having an indigenous people's center here. Yeah. And can you expand on that? Already? Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, I was going to get to that right eventually. There's <laughs> a lot to talk about. Um, Excuse me, Rick, before you go on, our Anthony, he's had an emergency, and unfortunately he's not going to make it back. Oh, no. Just, he asked me to let you know. Oh. Everything's okay, but so, yeah. Okay. Um, Don't know. Well, um, I've worked in beginning centers, native centers, in other places, in some places that, that may seem, at least uh, for some, fairly unlikely places. Um, and the one that's most relevant to here is that we started a native center when I was working at Yale. And when, when, when I was working there, and I got there and there was not a native center, it seemed to be absurd there's not one there, right? Um, and that was in 1997, um, so 21 years ago. So we immediately started working on them. And one of the students who was, is just a warrior and, and a force of nature is Amanda, I knew at the time as Amanda Sutter, she was, she was a Medi culture when she was yeah, here. Our um, yeah. She was on the, on the board of the library. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and on TI. And, and, and the library, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And she was a student, when I, when I first met her, she was a freshman at, uh, at, um, at Yale. And um, if you know Amanda, she, she already came to Yale with ideas. And uh, she's Choctaw and, and African American and is very proud of both her cultural heritages. And it was great because there was a confluence of people who had already been thinking about, working on, getting a, a Native Center. And when I got there, it became, it, it was already something that was going to be a priority for me. So it was great to know there were all these other these, these students who were there already who wanted to work on it. So we worked on it together. Um, long story short, we got, we got that. Um, within a couple of years, we had a Native Center. And it's still going stronger than ever now. And the beautiful thing is Amanda and I stayed close um, throughout the years since, since those days as we have with a lot of our, a lot of our students, which is really a blessing to, to us, to us as a family, to my wife and I, that we, we stayed so close to the students that I've, that I've worked with over the years. And so, um, in fact, the reason I, I just tell this little side story as to how Amanda got here, for those of you who know her, we had just gotten back from a trip where we came to Telluride my wife and I, just because we love to go to the mountains, we love to do outdoors things, we, 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 loved, we had loved Telluride, we'd been there at some, some earlier time, we came here, and then very soon after we came back, we had dinner with Amanda and her family, Amanda and Simon and the kids, and they were trying to figure out where to go for a vacation. Do they have kids yet? Might have been three kids, or they were really, I think, just... Okay, anyways, that doesn't matter. Um, it was a while back, six, seven years ago. And they were trying to figure out where to go for their vacation. I said, you have to go to Calorite. It's incredible. It's beautiful. <laughs> so they said, OK, we're going to go there. And then lo and behold, out of that, they decided they're going to live here. So they, they came back and they said, we want to live there. So they, they started looking for jobs. And Amanda can do hers kind of remotely, so it doesn't matter that, as much where she is. Simon found, of course, became a doctor at the clinic. And they, they lived here the years you know her. So we kept, we kept obviously, always close. and. Um, we'd, came out to visit them here, and one day we were just sitting around out in the backyard, you know, their house, they had a beautiful backyard, looked at the mountains, and I said, wouldn't this be a great place to have another native center, right? And the man was like, yes, let's have a native center in Telluride, and that's, that's kind of how the idea was hatched, <laughs> and I started talking to people about it, Pam first, who's, who's on the TI board, because um, she, she knew as well, and um, Amanda, I think, had mentioned it to her as well, so either same time, Roughly this around the same time, we both brought the idea to some people here in Telluride, and they got excited about it, you know, about the possibility. We don't, part of the discussions will take place over the next couple of days is just a conversation of, you know, whether that seems like a good idea, whether it would be feasible, what it might start, what it might look like, those kind of things. What we imagine is an internation center 
uh, you know, and it, if you will, an intertribal, not specifically a Ute center, but one that's, that's internation, because there, there was uh, a great many people who came through this area, um, even though we do consider it Ute land. Um, but it's also, I think, an opportunity for people who visit here and people who live here um, to find knowledge from a lot of different nations and also to bring indigenous people from a lot of different nations into Telluride to do what could be a range of things. They could be anything from um, presentations to um, film to um, art uh, showings to residencies for six months or a year of, 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 a, of an indigenous uh, knowledge keeper who, who would be able to share a number of things and work with other, you know, with other thinkers around, you know, around the Telluride area. You know, so there's all kinds of things I think can be done with it. And for me, I have to admit it was part of kind of a, a larger vision where a lot of these incredibly beautiful places, they're now some in many ways identified as sort of resort towns, if you will, but are in, on indigenous land, could also have a native center, an internation indigenous center. You know, the Telluride, the Jackson Holes, the Aspens of the world, you know, would be places would, that would bring back indigenous life um, and knowledge in, in a very intentional way through, through a center. So that's just the short version of it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to give a long version because that's a lot of what the discussions we're going to be having over the next couple of days and hopefully bring it to the, the, larger, the larger community and see what, see what people think, you know? It's a, it's a line item in the agenda at tomorrow's board meeting yeah. <laughs> yeah. for the Telluride Institute. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited to be out here. Yeah. People are also actually, frankly, surprised that there's a, there's an Indian center in New York City, because people know there's yeah. Native people all over the East Coast and in New York State. But they think of them like, well, the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois up north, or the Shinnecock out, Shinnecock out in the Long Island, or you know, <laughs> the Pequots who have that big casino up in Connecticut. You know, the Mohegan Sun. You know, they, they they know there's Native people, but for some reason, people just don't quite think of Native people in that urbanizing area. Maybe. New York City? What? You know? Because we have people, when, we, when I introduce myself and I include in my introduction that I'm, you know, the chair of the American Indian Community House, oftentimes the first question is, wow, there's, so there's, there's Native people? There's Native Americans in, in New York City? You know? So even New Yorkers are still learning that there's, there's, a, there's a community of, of Native people. It has been for, well, forever. If you if you talk about Lenape, but but there's been an intonation community in New York City for for you know decades and decades. So. And you you put the figure at about thirty thousand. Is that what you said well, that, earlier today? That's based on our own because yeah. I'll, some of the services we provide are, are 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 from federal agencies where the people receiving those services, you know, like certain medical services and and so forth and, and certain. Um, certain uh, referrals and, and benefits. They need to be tribally enrolled. So we, we've just sort of extrapolated how many tribally enrolled people there are in, in New York City. We think it's probably around 30,000, maybe 28,000 to 38,000. That's, that's, that's working with some other, some other institutes who helped us sort of you know, do, the, do the, you know, sort of the, the um, you know, statistical kinds of, um, you know, uh, calisthenics you need to do to try to come up with a figure. Um, the easier figure just comes from the census. In the last census, the 2010 census, for self-identified um, indigenous people is 100 is 100 108,000. So, but that but now we don't think that's off though, because as I, I've said it on other occasions today, even um, that would include. Um, a large population who are from Latin American and Caribbean backgrounds who, who identify and in fact are indigenous but just aren't tribally enrolled because that's not the way the system works you know, in, in other countries. It's pretty much the US and Canada where it has that tribal enrollment, blood quantum thing going on. Other places, if you're part of an indigenous community, you're indigenous. You know, that's, that's how your indigeneity is defined. If you're part of a community and you, you, you know, you have learned to be part of that community from your, from your elders and, and from your ceremony and so forth. So um, we have Taino people who, who people think are, are no longer with us, but they certainly are. Some of our, our, strongest, our strongest members in the community house are Taino. 
Um, and then we have people from all over Latin America. I mean, there's large populations from Latin America of indigenous people. So Taino, Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, yeah. Course, yeah. Who were the first contact. Mm -hmm. So they, they bore the brunt. So we always give our blessings to Taino people um, as, as having to take that first shock wave, you know. But, um, but those, that's all to say also. I can imagine, all, all, you know, with an internation center, you know, I can see people coming from all over the world and learning more about even their own people of their own lands or their own where they're from in a way they may not have, that they don't have a chance to do in, unless they're visiting and have some time and, you know, can come to a, a center, you know. So my, my, my philosophy is the more places you can have that shares indigenous knowledge, that brings indigenous people, the better. You know, the better, the better it'll be for everybody because I just think that knowledge is going to, is going to help help everybody in terms of how they understand the world and you know how they how they come to you know feel about you know where we are all where we all are in this world and so. Right. I wonder if uh, picking up on that, if you could speak just for a, a couple of minutes about what your, how your presentation was uh, uh, this morning. Yeah. To, in the classrooms, uh, you know, uh, how did you approach that? How did, what was it that, that uh, guided that outline? Um, that's a good question. Part of it now, and I'm not, I don't mean to call anybody out, but we, I didn't know exactly who I'd be speaking to, to, speaking to till fairly late. I didn't know which schools, probably because I had to change my, my travel plans, because our, our flight, I was supposed to come in last night. Well, my flight was canceled, the flight mm -hmm. that I was going to take into Telluride, mm -hmm. so I had to reroute it to Montrose, so I got in later. So they had to adjust their schedule as well, so I wasn't, they weren't even quite sure if I was going to be able to speak. They thought it might, it could possibly be too late to actually speak to any students. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of going through a lot of things, and it's sometimes hard when you don't have much idea what your audience is, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what level of sort of knowledge they would already have. So what I figured I would do is just give an outline of the most sort of important values and life ways in a, in a broad way, which is why, why I started talking the way I did. That's why I, I talked about, you know, relations, you know, how we're relational and not transactional, sovereignty, um, land-based and, and place-based, um, because those are, those are things that we, all, we always want people to know about us as people, you know. Um, sometimes people know maybe more because of where they've been, they know more about our regalia you know, where they know maybe more about um, how we've, you know, how we've been displaced from our land or something. And those are, those are, those are absolutely important things to know about who we are. Um, but I'd rather start with who we are and who we've always been, even before contact. Those were always things that were, that were part of part of our identity. They're not part of our identity in relation to something else. They're part of our identity that's been that's been brought to us. You know, throughout, throughout our, our, all of our time, through our ancestors and our elders, so that's, that's, that's why I thought of it like that. Um, and I, and I never, and I never mean to dumb it down, because those students might have been way ahead of me. They might have already known all that, and I could have, I could have actually gone on to, to other subject matters, but I, I didn't, I didn't know whether to, or I didn't know, so I just, I just figured I'd concentrate on the essentials. Um, and then talked a little bit about about language and um, and then a little bit about um, and the second the second one um, because I was asked by their teacher to talk a little bit more about how they could how they could indigenize you know how you would go about indigenizing you know wherever you were and so that's the second one I, were you at I was not oh, okay. So the second one, I, I thought it was nice because there was a lot of feedback from, from the people there. And we talked about if you wanted to bring more indigenous knowledge, how would you personally go about doing it? So I asked them what kind of leaders they were, you know, what they've done in the community, what they've done at their school. And of course, they've all done lots. But it's just a matter of who, who sort of will step up and, and you know, say something in the, in the middle of the class. So I had one who was a cross-country champion. I talked about what he could do as a leader in, in athletics, you know. One was, um, had done an internship um, and had done work around, uh, around uh, pollution and, and, and the environment. 
and then one was of all things the, the class, the student class president. So it was three. It was probably, actually ended up being three good people that we could have a little discussion about what could they do, you know, to bring to bring more indigenous knowledge into their into their arenas that they have influence in, you know, because they're looked at as as leaders, um, and that's 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 important, you know. I don't know if that answers. Thank you. I'm Audrey. Hi, Audrey. Did you uh, present the idea of the cultural center to them? Uh, in terms of the possibility of having it here? I did a little. We didn't talk about it a lot. Um, there's never that much time, you know. The class periods are pretty short, <laughs> you know. So uh, we didn't we didn't go too much into that, no. And and I, and to be honest, I'm not sure because we're in such early stages of our own conversation. I'm not sure how much I want to start, you know, talking about it because I don't I don't want to I don't want any missteps, you know. I don't want someone to come back later saying, "Hey, you said this," and and then we end up doing something entirely different, or you know, I I just I'm trying to just be. Be very, um, very mindful, very thoughtful about you know when I'll talk about something. The things I think I can talk about fairly confidently, I'll talk about those things um, because I feel I feel I have permission to do so. But to be honest, I wasn't sure how much latitude I had to talk about, especially with students about about the center. If if we get to a later point in the discussion, and and people here in the community would like me to talk to our youth because I think it's incredibly important. If it starts to move forward, there are youth be involved in that discussion, and once once I get a very clear indication that, that we can start doing that, I would love to come back and talk to them, and and I would do it. I would prepare in a way for that discussion. I would get things together. I would I would I would have ways in which we could do sort of a more interactive um, dialogue around around that topic. You may ask another question. Uh -huh. So, in terms of your own land situation in New York City. Have you been introduced to Dan Tishman yet, who has a home here in Telluride? He's one of the biggest no, real estate no. people in the country. We know who he is. <laughs> have you had an introduction no, to him yet? No, we have not. How about Jonathan Rose? No. Okay. And we're, we're, if, you, if you can do that, we'd be, we'd be very happy. The Lipton's only is maybe able to do that for you. Yeah. I know you'll be seeing them later, so you might, I, whatever, whoever can make that suggestion, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'd be very happy to be introduced to whoever whoever has, you know. It just kind of seems that there's a movement now in many areas that we have to do a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. That these things that are happening at this level, whether it's affordable housing in our own community or efforts like yours, really for them to be successful, we've got to join forces and um, do it in a more creative way than what it's been done in the past, whether it's just government driven or private driven, but bring all of these entities together to really make it happen and be more successful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, it'd be great if those conversations started to happen. My name is Bernie. I have a question Bernie. about the uh, sort of what I see anyway is the emerging global movement around uh, Indigenous rights and indigenous land tenure, um, which you know you must have a lot of perspective on, having been doing this for a number of years now, and also doing it out of New York City, which is such a kind of international center. And so what I see is that there's kind of a lot more collaboration between different indigenous groups that, like I mean, like indigenous groups in Africa or in India, in the Americas globally. Um, and that it's now recognized by uh, conservation funders and you know development or anti poverty funders as a really effective uh, way to fight poverty, fight deforestation, hmm. um, is funding or supporting indigenous communities get mm -hmm. tenure to land that <clears throat> maybe their tenure, their ownership is informal, maybe it was taken away from them. You know, a long time ago. I wonder if you have any any thoughts on that movement. Yeah, uh, you're. Yes, you're absolutely right. That is that is happening, and it's certainly one of the things that that we end up spending a lot of time communicating with one another when we at the, we're at the UN Permanent Forum. So many people come in from these different places. Um, the challenge is, I think there's simultaneous um, movements, if you will, um, 
because while that's happening, there's also huge development projects mm -hmm. um, that are going on um, who actually are not interested in having the indigenous voice involved in those development, de development projects. So um, it, it, it becomes one where we are, part of it just becomes where we need to kind of put our, ourselves into, like, you know, how, how do we, it's a capacity issue, like how many things can we, you know, can we really be involved with and can we really, can we really put ourselves into, um, but, you know, it also, it also speaks to what you're talking about, there need to be partnerships, relations, there needs to be a lot of people who are involved in supporting one another around that, and a lot of the work that we do is try to find ways in which people um, are, are working together on those kinds of things, um, and people who are not indigenous, who are also understanding, you know, how vital and how much indigenous people can contribute to those, you know, to those kinds of efforts. Um, and we're always looking to find ways where international bodies can support those efforts as well, you know, where the UN can step in, international human rights, and, you know, of course, you know that we, there is in, in a doc, there is a, a document that that um, that spells out all the rights we have as indigenous people, and if it were followed, we wouldn't be having the struggles because <laughs> that's that's those are the, it's very clear as to what needs to be done around those around those lands that have been that have been indigenous lands, you know. So um, yeah. Um, There's, there's so much. <laughs> what do I, sometimes I'm at a loss of where I can where I can start with some of this. Um, I think um, I think one of the ways we need to do it is, and you've already alluded to this, is find places where we've successfully been able to, if you will, protect an area or or be able to, to, to find ways that everybody benefits from protecting an area and really make sure people understand how that happened. Um, and that's, you know, that's a lot of what the work that's being done now, you know. Um, and the more people we can find who, who, who will help us do that and then we can help them do that, you know, because um, sometimes, you know, these, <coughs> these commitments, um, they, they shift all the time. You know, you're not sure um, who's going to be with you in the long run. You know, so you've got to find ways to make even the movement sustainable. And we, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how, how to make sure we, we keep that, that, that movement sustainable as well. So, um, and, a, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, really finding ways in which not just indigenous people benefit you know, from protecting our lands, but, but everybody does, you know, and, 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 you know, larger populations benefit from it. Yeah, I think that right now the emergency, emerging consensus in the conservation community um, from a whole bunch of studies is that uh, indigenous managed protected areas or indigenous managed lands have like less deforestation, less, um, habitat destruction than national protected areas mm -hmm. and unprotected areas. And yeah. those studies have really sort of galvanized the conservation funding community um, to really work together with the indigenous rights community to support that, you know, those efforts to get that legal tenure. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, I, I have a r related question. I don't know anything about it, just pondering it. But it seems like um, of the former British colonies, <clears throat> this is about reparations. You know, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada seem to be a way ahead of the United States in terms of uh, reparations with their indigenous community, meaningful reparations yeah. with the indigenous and communities. Reconciliation. reconciliation. Um, any thoughts on that? Like why the U.S. is uh, sort of lagging? Yeah, we, we talk about that a lot, and there's some things that people think are, are very are very temporal. They're very, you know they're, they're very current, mm -hmm. like who's in power right now. Sure. Um, but I don't think that's a, that's the answer, right? Because this has been going on for so long. Mm -hmm. um, 
I actually have a couple theories, and they're not they're not entirely substantiated. Sure. So bear with me. Um, I'll just do one comparison because we talk about this a lot. If you compare the U.S. with with, with New Zealand, mm -hmm. New Zealand is is primarily one indigenous identity. Even though there's certainly a great diversity within the Maori, yeah. there there is a certain there's a certain common identity among Maori people. Mm -hmm. And so for them to unify, and for over the years, which they have over the decades, for them to put, because I don't have to tell you this, no government anywhere will do things for indigenous people without pressure. Mm, yeah. Just will not happen. Will not happen. So it really gets to the question, who was able to apply the pressure and, 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 ha and, and work the advocacy, the strategy around advocacy um, in the most effective way, right? And so you start thinking about what were the strategies and, and what, what made them most effective. And I think the, one of the ways the Mari were able to do that is that they really did, in the begin, in, right from the start, had something of a more unified base. You know, so they were able to work together in a way that us as 535 recognized federal tribes, federally recognized tribes cannot necessarily, right? It's a little more difficult for us to have that unified voice and put, and put that unified pressure um, on, on, the, on, the, on the U.S. government or even local governments. Even local governments, oftentimes there's a number of, of, of Bears Ears being a perfect example. Five yeah. tribal nations had to come together just for that one area, and it was unprecedented. So that's, that oftentimes is, is, is half, is half the, 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 the work is, is for us to come together in some unified way in a, in, in enough to put, to put pressure. Um, that was what was going on in California, when we were trying to stop the canonization of, of Sarah, you know. Um, so going back to New Zealand, that was part of it. The other thing, they, I think they were very, very smart in what they chose to be their pressure points, you know. Um, and people probably know about the Maori and the New Zealand case enough, and so I don't want to get into the whole history of that. But that's, that's another part of it, is finding, finding, being very, very adept at finding the pressure, pressure points. And I'm not sure we've done that as well. I'm not sure we've, we've found the pressure points as well. Um, along with that, I would also say that I'm not sure we've always found where to use compromise and where not to. I feel like sometimes we've compromised in places that, that already made it difficult to, for us to get back to a place where we need to be. And I'll give you one example. In law, when you look at what's commonly called Indian law, we sort of already gave away in much of the, the history of Indian law the fact that that we're essentially tenants on this land, you know, because for, for, for us to do that, I think the philosophy for a long time was that enabled us to win more legal cases. You know, if we could, if we could go along with the fact that we're a protectorate of the United States, and we sort of, we sort of gave that away already, with, as opposed to saying, no, we're, we're, this is nation to nation, clearly sovereign. Um, and, and not always, but I'm saying to a great extent that was what Indian law, you know, gave already away. And so it, it gets harder for us to go back again and sort of, you know, sort of build again the case um, for, for, our, for our sovereignty and for our nation-to-nation -nation status. Um, those kind of, I think, are, are all interrelated. Um, and I, then I think, you know, kind of on a, on a, on a separate side, um, not separate, but I think as a, a, for a, another distinct reason um, that I don't think we've made as much as much progress, if you will, is that, um, and I don't want to get controversial here, so I know I'm being taped and I know this isn't this is going to go over all that well, but um, I, I think a lot of, on an institutional level, on a governmental level, I think a lot of our nations, you know, needed to find a way to be, to have governments that were compatible with the way the U.S. envisioned what government should be, um, and I'm not saying it was a, necessarily a bad thing. It just it just meant that 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 we didn't we didn't have a way of doing things that might have been that might have been very unique in, in providing other 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 avenues for for getting the work that we needed to get done. Um, and I think we're getting back to that. I think there's more of a traditional, more of a traditional voice um, in how we should do things. But um, for many, many years, we had, of course, tribal governments. 
and tribal governments were very much a replication. And we're just, let's face it, they, this is historical. They were designed to be replications of the U.S. government, you know. Um, and they weren't, they weren't necessarily the traditional way in which we did things. And, and those people who did hold on to the very traditional ways in which, or much closer to the very traditional ways in which they did things, this again, this is my opinion, I'm only speaking for myself, I think we're able to make greater progress and greater advancement. An example of that, the Haudenosaunee kept Longhouse, right? And there was a time where they, they were determining a lot of ways in which they were going to govern themselves, and, and there's a great diversity in, in, in ways in which they made decision, decisions, but they never let go of Longhouse. Right as a as a way in which they did, and if you look at how, what the Haudenosaunee have accomplished, they have the international agreements that other tribal nations don't have between the U.S. and Canada. They're going through a lot of challenges now because it's a new administration, but they found they 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 found ways in which they can move between Canada and the U.S. in, in ways you know in agreements they they reached. Um, I think because they always preserved uh, a certain level of sovereignty, right. Um, they have their own passport, you know, and when they had their, their international lacrosse games, people could come in and they went through the Haudenosaunee Nation with their passports from whatever other country they came from, right, in a way that hasn't happened really anywhere else in the U.S. Well, they you know, stamp? And they stamped them. Yeah, absolutely. They're the ones, who, they're the ones who, who, who said, yes, you are an international traveler, you are here now, we've stamped your passport. Yeah, so, um, and I'm not saying... I'm not, and I'm not trying to create any, you know, any lateral kind of oppression between us. We're, all, we're everybody's doing great things. I really do believe that all of us as indigenous people are working the best way we can. I'm just talking about how we might be finding some ways where we can move, we can move ahead, you know, in in, in ways that that are more like um, the ways that the things that have happened, particularly, say, in New Zealand to some extent, Canada. Um, although Canada, you know. Yes, they have reconciliation, and yes, they recognized, you know, that they, they had, you know, incredibly damaging schools. But, you know, I talked to a lot of, a lot of our folks, a lot of our relations who are up in Canada, and they're not satisfied. You know, yes, there's, there's money going out. There's, in a sense, there's reparations, if you will. There's a recon reconciliation council, but there's also a lot of ways in which they're, it's, it's a, it's, they're using that to, to manipulate decision making again. You know, and. Mm. And that's something that I'm sure you've spoken with First Nations with, you know, indigenous folks up in Canada who will say that who will say they're not they're not completely satisfied with how things have, have gone there, you know. So um, it's it's tough. It's and I don't have the answers, you know. Those are just those are things that I do that we do discuss and we think about in terms of you know why certain other countries, um, you know, have have different, you know, perhaps. More progressive policies around around Aboriginal people, around Indigenous people, and part of it's just the resistance, you know, from whoever's in the country. Some 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 places, you know, you're just going to have more resistance. And I think, you know, we have a, a very large conservative population in the U.S. and always have, you know, and they're going to be they're going to be resistant to these things. And frankly, I think it's also because there's a lot of people in power who understand once that discussion gets going. You know, it's can, everything can start to unravel, you know, because I don't have, I, I, you know, again, I'll just be plain speak. This country's built on a tremendous amount of mythology, you know, if, and if that mythology starts to be debunked, you know, a lot just starts to, a lot just starts to unravel, you know. And if, if people really were having to admit that even portions of the U.S., the land was got in an illegitimate way, well then, well, how about there and how about there and how about there and how about you know like pretty soon it becomes this 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 very this very large issue of 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 um, of really calling into question in many ways this whole country <laughs> you know and I and I think there's people who know that if 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 they start to recognize certain things like even the boarding schools you know as this brutal assimilation process and they they recognize as yes it was wrong and. Should not have been done. There's got to be a way in which we, we reconcile that and, and provide reparations. Then it gets into all the other kinds of policies that were equally as 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 violent, you know. As well as obviously the land issue, you know, because I mentioned this earlier today. The the Haudenosaunee have an ongoing battle with Syracuse around recognizing the trees that were broken in order for that land to be taken over, 
because Syracuse is clearly on treaty broken land. You know, mm -hmm. there's documentation around that. But if Syracuse admits that, what does that mean? Everybody's got to pull up and move, you know, and the Haudenosaunee move back into Syracuse? Of course it doesn't mean that. But, I mean, people in their minds are thinking, well, if we admit to this, if we admit we're truly on stolen land, does that mean we have to give it up? You know, so just some thoughts. Sorry for Graham going on and on. <laughs> we were talking about what would it mean to do a... 10 foot by 10 foot square around the stone at Placerville with the plaque, you know, and actually go through a whole process of deeding the property to the Ute Nation, you know. And we had this discussion down at the Placerville Schoolhouse on Saturday, you know, and, and Regina Lopez White Skunk, you know, was there leading the discussion. And it, it's a complicated, crazy yeah. consideration, yeah. but if even that little piece were uh, given over in recognition that this was originally Ute land, let's say, uh, it's a very slippery slope. And you know, it, there's no, <laughs> and and there's no mistake, that, it's like that. It's not a coincidence, it's like that, you know that. It's yeah. Yeah. built to be like that. Yeah. And does that, if that is deeded over, then does that mean that the rest of the coming. land is categorically not? So, right. you know, what Regina was saying to us is, we don't really believe in land ownership. No. And um, so then why would we be interested in ownership and maybe even that designation would mean then, then you don't own, you own this, but you don't own. Of course. What yeah. surrounds it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a complicated yes. one. Hi, I'm Cherokee Sinusai. Hey, um, Cherokee. So I was kind of wondering, how do you really build up a lot of awareness around and like gain the love and compassion of mainly conservative people and also people in urban cities because I'm from I'm from Minneapolis and I just moved out here. I know. So going from a city from where first urban Indian center. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and um, going from that, I I really think a, a large part of people not caring about like pipelines and our land is really about just them not knowing, like not having the knowledge and the. Uh, resources to really learn about what it's actually going to do and how much it's going to affect them. Mm -hmm. So how do we go about also bringing that awareness up, but also of our indigenous women, like, you know, going missing around pipeline workers and mm -hmm. when pipelines are starting to be built and how do we like get people to truly care about that? Because these aren't the ones making headlines, you know, like, mm. just wondering about that. That's a, that's a, too big. That's a million. That's, yeah. that's, a, that's a million wampum question. You know, um, I, I don't. I, the only answer I have is continue doing what we're doing. You know, all of us collectively, mm -hmm. just raising awareness and bringing our stories to as many people as we can, and and bringing our stories to people who may have more influence over decision making, and um, and bringing bringing actions to bear where they need to be, like a Standing Rock, and. Um, and, and working with all of our lawyers to make sure that people who do, you know, abduct our young women from those man camps around the pipelines get caught and prosecuted, you know, um, and just, just, yeah, just continue to do all that work. You know, I don't know any other way to do it. There's no, there's, you know that, there's no, there's no, there's no magic button, you know. Um, I think a lot of what we've learned too, Cherokee, is it's it's within our own community. We have the power to do it in our own community. If we had a glimpse of that, it wasn't standing luck. Mm -hmm. You know, we came together as internation, and and we were able to raise a lot of awareness, and it and it actually was something on on people's mind for a long period of time. You know, everybody there was a period where a lot of people were talking about it, and a lot of people wanted to know more about it, and a lot of people were trying to understand more about these extractive industries every everywhere. You know, and and people who are nowhere near pipelines, or so they thought. I mean, everybody is near one, but some people think they're nowhere near pipelines, or nowhere near fracking, or tar sands, or anything else. They started learning, like, they started doing their own research, going, holy, holy shit, there's, there's some of this stuff going on, like, five miles from me, you know? New Yorkers started realizing, there's pipelines going underneath the Hudson River. What? You know? Like, a lot of people, you know? And uh, so there's, there's times I feel where we, we, you know, we really just capture the moment, and we as indigenous people have to do everything we can, you know, to, to, to bring notice to, to, to what, what our experience is and, and you know, what, what our challenges are, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
and there were there were there were all kinds of water protectors who were ready to go to bear's ears, and they're like, "We're ready now." We're, gonna, <laughs> we're like, "Well, this is a little bit different." You know, this is a little bit different situation. First of all, it's it's 50 times bigger, so I'm not sure where where we'd even start to build the same kind of movement we did at Standing Rock. So the strategy changes everywhere, but but uh, I I really do I really do believe it's within us. It's it's within our prayer, you know. That's within our wisdom, mm -hmm. you know. That's that's what we find out too. Is that it, we as indigenous people have to go back, and and go back to our prayer, go back to our ceremony, and that's where we're gonna, you know, learn what we need to be doing, you know, and and all of our young people, because a lot of our young people, you know, are are struggling, they're struggling, you know, and it's it's you know it's and we just have to keep working with our young people and, and making sure that that all the things that can encroach on on our lives are are something we can we can stop and we can care for our young people and um, yeah but you have as, as much an answer as I do you know <laughs> what do you think it is I'll ask you mm -hmm. about uh how do you what? think we how do you think we turn people's consciousness around <laughs> that's a that's tough like you said I guess a large part would just be really educating people yeah and getting them to really realize I feel like there's such a disconnection between like self of people's like self-awareness of their <coughs> ego and then what like is really happening in the world and so and a lot of these times people don't really like go into the areas to like look out and find their news you know a lot of people's news are all these huge so social media outlets like Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, and whatsoever, and all this false news is being put out there, and people are realizing, and like believing it, and not questioning it. And I think really, like building relationships between people, because mm -hmm. I feel like when you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone, I feel like they really do want to change more, or they're being more open, you know. And uh, I, th it's really hard because. I mean, it it's kind of feels like an oppression Olympic, you know? Because so many people are disconnected and we're being so hurt in this area and other people are being, we're so hurt in this area. And there's so much pain that we all do need to really realize that, like, our pain is our own, but we can only fix it as, if we're all working together. But that's hard because people have their own lives and, like, the conventional world we live in today is so revolved around working and making money and all this, like, artificial dreams that really disassociate them from living back to the land you know mm -hmm. people are busy bees and living in mega cities and not being out here you know like you talk to people in the city and they're like i would never want to go out on a camping trip you know and you could question yourself like how could you not want to see this beautiful pine trees you know even if it's like five or six on a campground at least you yeah. know something that's out of the city but i feel like that's really a big thing and our food too. I feel like people, the food that we eat is a really big portion of them not understanding how important it is for us to treat our land right so then we can get the right nutrients we need from the earth to mm -hmm. properly function as humans. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know that's a huge thing right now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Indigenous food yeah. Beautiful. Right on. Rick, I don't think it would be too much of a stretch to say at least an appreciation of indigeneity is a kind of provides a window into these larger issues of st sustainability and a kind of an environmental consciousness, a sustainable environmental consciousness. One window into that is understanding the indigenous experience. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, you, you hear of all kinds of people who come out to, to, to native land and it changes them. It changes it changes their life, you know, and when they spend time, you know, when they spend time with people and build those relations. But I go back to what you said. I really do believe that. I believe the people who are angry, who are out there and angry and, and whatever they may be identified as, conservatives or whatever else, a lot of people the are white there. People. Was that? The white people. The angry white people or the an angry indigenous people? I would say, yeah. A angry angry point, white men. This would be, I'd say, angry. <laughs> At this point, I would say the angry white people, I think they are hurt. I think it is a pain. I think their anger comes from a pain, you know, and we have to 
find, we have to spend time to find out what it is. And it could be something very, very personal to projecting out into sort of the larger political world. I, I really do believe that. I believe that it's, it's people who've been hurt even in relationships, you know, or have been hurt, they lost, a, you know, their, 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 their sense of identity because they lost their job, you know, or, or they were demoted from being, you know, someone who they felt was really contributing to society by whatever they may have been doing. Let's, I'm just stating an easy one. They were steel workers, and now they work at Walmart. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's demeaning. It's demeaning. You know, I've lost a job before. It's it's incredibly demeaning because we're we're so our identity is so tied into that work that we do. You know, and relationally too. If we have a relationship and and the person we love leaves leaves you for whatever reason that may be, it's painful. You know, and I think sometimes all those very personal pains get tied up into the into sort of the larger political, and they start they start you know deciding oh. This is what's going to make things better if this this particular person and their particular you know, I ideology comes to the comes to the front, but in the end, we know that's not really what it is. In the end, it really is about relational building and one, and people caring for one another, which isn't really political, you know. Um, so, well, we have been trying to extinguish the indigenous identity since 1607. Yeah, right. And, um, and 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 my generation and all those old farts in Washington, D.C., they grew up on cowboy and Indian movies. Yeah. And they think that the Indians were our enemies. Yeah. And that, that, that it was our manifest destiny to take this land and, and use it. And, uh, and that, I mean, that God gave us uranium and coal and all these things <laughs> to use. Yeah. And, and There's a papal bull, as I said. Yeah. You know, one, one church even well, declared I'd, it like the highest, highest yeah, order of I'd population. Love to, I'm going to look up. Look yeah. that up. That's Thank just you. amazing that, that they did that. It's like uh, Winona LaDuke said, uh, I'm human first, you know? Like, and then I'm Indian, you know? It's yeah. like people need to realize really like that identity does really lay within humanity, you know, mm -hmm. individual. Very yeah. good, yeah. Now, I, I, I finding the similarities first. How, 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 how can we get to see people? How, how can we teach people to see the humanity in, in, all, in, in all of humanity? My name is Michael, Michael Rude Boyce. Well, that's, that's hard, too. I would say uh, a lot of the time, I mean, like, we're so conditioned nowadays with all these stereotypes, like, if it's within, like, subliminal references or people, you know, like, regular stereotypes that people look at every day and these cartoons and, like, everything that we grew up, like, pop culture, and it's really hard because that's, like, what mainly influences people to really believe, like, what people are like until they truly see it, you know? Like, some people will completely think there are just super rich Indians, and that's all Indians are, you know? But no. Casinos, no less. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and then they've, they've never been to Pine Ridge, you know? They've never been to some yeah. Ojibwe reservation, in the, you know? And it's like, I think uh, it's, it's separation. It's more focus on self, because people need to be able to fix themselves before they can fix or try and relate to anyone else. So I think really the endeavor for humanity to really separate from like the materialistic and the greedy mm -hmm. world and come back to like, before we didn't have money, what did we have? We had like each other. We were living in tribes, traveling together, hunting, feeding, you know, one another. And that's hard to see because people, I mean, of course, you know, we live in now. Now is, it's hard to get out of now. It's hard to relate the past from now because it's not. So we really, I guess have to dig deep and want to change and want to feel that connected and connection with people, you know, and that's really about building a relationship independently between people and realizing on your own, like your own spirituality in a way, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, what's hard is that um, people have to follow a lot of times what's given to them in terms of how they're gonna how they're gonna survive. Um, and if you're in an inquisitive, profit motive motivated economy, it's hard to think of others. You, you do have to think about you know how you're gonna succeed in this. You know, it's not the, the, it's not built to take care of one another. It's built to compete, it's built to make sure that you find a way that you can be successful and, and you know make for yourself. It's not it's not really built to where you're saying, you know, unlike a lot of you know, like just an example, you know, Northwestern tribes had potlatch. The economy was all built on giving to others, not trying to get from from someplace. It was built literally on giving. And your status rose by how much you were able to give, you know? Um, so when you have an entire society that nurtures that way of thinking, it's easier to see each other as someone who you need to have a relation with and love and so forth, you know? When there's, a, when there's an entire system built, you know, to sort of encourage, you know, um, being acquisitive, acqui acquisitive and, 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 you know, building your own wealth and, and building your own individual status, you know, it's, 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 it goes against, you know, the, you know, anybody else's efforts to, to try to get one another to, to, to be together and, and, and sharing with one another. You know, my mom used to talk to me about this stuff a lot, you know, because she would always talk about how those aren't, that, those aren't who we are. We're people who, we're generous people who share. Um, but she would warn me that you're going to go out into a world where that's not going to be the case, you know. Um, and you're going to go into places where you want to share with everyone, you want to share ideas, you want to, but instead you go into a place and I can talk about where I've had a lot, a lot of my experience in academia, where ideas become property also, and they're protected as if they were property. You know, and people don't share, um, you know, and then they appropriate other ideas when they can. You know, even though they're saying these ideas need to be protected, <laughs> you know, so there's all these contradictions, and it's just, you know, it's it's crazy. Um, so I don't know. It's just she. I can remember her talking to me about it. You know that that you're gonna go, you're gonna you're gonna experience a world where where it's gonna be very difficult for for people to understand that that you want to share. You know, and that's how you understand the world. And. Um, I think, we, you know, those of us at the Telluride Institute would be very interested in the feedback from this group as to what your ideas would be. Maybe not in this, maybe not right now, but I mean, we could, uh, you know, an email or whatever to, uh, you know, info at TellurideInstitute.org um, would come to us. And I think we'd, we'd need to kind of maybe actively put that out there as an invitation for ideas, for envisioning what... Uh, a, it, an indigenous center would look mm -hmm. like. Who would it serve? What higher purposes? What's the vision? What's the mission of such a center? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of expanding it to this kind of mm -hmm. this gentleman that had to leave a, a kind of global indigeneity. What does that mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the inter you, were, you were talking about not the United Nations, Inter -nation. but yeah. is there a center? Is there an international? Is there a center that is an international international center somewhere like a, a no, UN we, for? We talk about that all the time. That comes up every not just at the UN permanent yeah. forum. Yeah, we talk about that all the time. That we need our own UN. Yes. Yeah. Well, Regina was talking Saturday about with her experience with the five tribes, people don't talk to each other. The tribes are still enemies uh, and um, are in opposition. And, um, you know, uh, and she talked about, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you, but I won't talk to that um, Hopi. 
But they did come together on the bear's ears yeah, yeah. issue. It was and a very, it's, it's, very it's, unique yeah. and unbelievable yeah. and, effort. And, and she said it was a huge struggle. Yeah, it, it was. was, but they did it. Yeah. And there's a film on it, you probably know, done by a dear friend of mine, Angela Baca, who did, he's, he's from Bears Ears, he's now, he's, he's Danae. He did a film on that whole process, how it came about. So if you get a chance to ever, if there's ever a screening, in fact, we should have a screening here. Yeah. You know, figure out where to have a screening of it. Because it, it shows the process by which the five tribal nations came together, you know, and it, you're, it, was, it was, it was, it was, it was long and hard, but it's going to always be like that. It, it's like that at the UN, you know, it doesn't keep, that doesn't keep European and, and other nations from, from forming, you know. The UN, they don't all yeah. get along. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> really? No. But, yes, but somehow that's, <laughs> but somehow when you say that about indigenous people, oh, we don't all get along, it's sort of like us, it stops the whole show. You know, he says, okay, we, we won't even think about it anymore. You know? Well, when people it's gonna, it's gonna be a struggle. Each other, it's hard. Yeah. And I'll tell you also, I'll say this, you know who's changing it? The young people. Yeah. The young people in our indigenous nations are, are changing that. They, they, they're they already working together in so many ways. I really do believe this is us older farts, as you were, to use your term, who are, who are the ones who are the ones keeping it from happening. Um, and I'm, I'm blessed because I spend a lot of my time with young people, so I'm all with them. I'm all in on it. You know, and, and, I, and, I, and I want them to lead us out of this, you know, out of this place where we can't, we can't seem to to come together in a, in, a, in a unified way as indigenous folks. And I think they can do it. I think they're already showing they can. And part of it, like you, you were talking about before, is digitally. I mean, there's young people from indigenous nations all over the world are already communicating with one another and, and, and coming to agreements about a lot of things, you know? So, and they're, they're, they're not, they're not, whatever these old, whatever these old conflicts were, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not gonna, Hold of those anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't want. Uh, my name's Durfee. I, I don't, hey, Durfee. <clears throat> one way to see it, it is to see the the connections. You know, the way that I I felt about it is that we are one blood, and we find what it is that is the connective tissues that bind and, and allow relationships and, and allow um, engagement. 